Well, one of the most topical issues in Ghana today has to do with the economy. Uh, already, the government of Ghana is in negotiations with the International Monetary Fund uh, to negotiate for a bailout program. Uh, even before that negotiation is concluded, we are privileged to be joined by the country director of the World Bank, uh, Mr. Pierre Laporte. He's in charge of Ghana, Liberia, and Sierra Leone. He's my guest on Business Focus tonight. Uh, good evening, sir, and thanks for your time. Good evening. Thank you for having me. So you've been in Ghana for three years now, mm -hmm. and uh, how has it been for you? It's been great. It's a, it's a lovely country, lovely people. Happy to be here. Mm. Tell me about the experience. Well, I mean, uh, I came to Ghana as country director um, from Cote d'Ivoire, and I think it's been uh, an interesting experience in that uh, the countries have a lot of similarities, being in the same zone, same challenges, socially, economically, at the same time, culturally, there are some differences. And uh, on the work front, it's been an interesting time because uh, as an economist, we're talking about the economy today, you know, we've seen uh, quite some interesting evolution in the last three years, including the COVID pandemic. There's a lot happening globally with inflation, growth slowing down, and this has impacted a lot of emerging markets like Ghana. Uh, what's your own assessment of, of what's happening in this part of the world? Look, first, uh, we should note that it's not only really affected emerging markets, it's really affected even the advanced economies in Europe, as for instance, uh, China, you know, having a lot of challenges. So, uh, COVID was already a very difficult uh, uh, issue to deal with because of the impact on uh, on the economy, on jobs, on uh, employment. But then the crisis in Ukraine has exacerbated the situation for everyone. And in terms of what we're seeing in Africa, there's been obviously a, a general trend of uh, inflation, you know, rising prices of food and fuel especially. And you know, in our countries, uh, mo most of the countries are poor countries. So it's been really hard for for the people and uh, as governments, uh, you know, most governments have tried to, you know, to, to, to assist the population so through a mix of, uh, of, of actions and measures, including subsidizing certain, certain aspects, but also trying to manage the, the trade-offs that exist when you have to, to spend more than you originally plan or you have issues like debt rising to, to accommodate this crisis so what's your own assessment of what has brought us where we are today uh, of course it's the fiscal side we know we've overspent uh, but of course this has led to huge uh, indebtedness um, we've had to seek for an IMF bailout what's your own assessment of what has brought us here today yeah, the, the big issue has been on the fiscal side right because on the, on the one hand, even uh, before the current crisis uh, happened, you know, we, we observed certain uh, challenges on, on the budget side that uh, really has been the area more, more hit by everything, but also where, where actions are required now to, to, to deal with them. For instance, uh, on the revenue side, we've always been saying that uh, this is an area, a weak area where Ghana should do better and uh, you know we are encouraged by the fact that uh, this should be one of the areas uh, for for a potential program with the fund and support from the from the world bank uh, but the problem is not just fiscal not just revenue the problem is uh, there are also spillovers from other sectors for instance the energy sector there's about 1 billion dollars being going to the energy sector because of losses. The sector itself is not financially viable. And to keep it going, government has had to subsidize. So actions are required in these areas also. And of course, with, you know, with COVID, the general business environment has been more difficult. Interest rates in Ghana are very high, relatively high. And it's been made worse now with the rising inflation, central bank rightly so have had to tighten fiscal policy by raising rates. So this has uh, really affected, uh, you know, business growth and employment. So it's a combination of all these, these, these factors. And now uh, through COVID and through the current crisis, there are two ways government could fund 
the, 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 the fiscal needs. One is by raising revenues, which has not happened really in a significant way that is needed, or else borrow. And you borrow, you know, you increase that debt. What about cutting expenditure? Cutting expenditure has been challenging because of rigidities that exist in the structure of Ghana's uh, uh, expenditure. Uh, a significantly large amount of revenues are going to pay salaries, which are, you know, you cannot cut salaries. You can cut some, you know, but in a significant way, you have to pay salaries. You can delay payment of a project, a road or a school, but you cannot not pay people's salary. Over 80% of Ghana's revenues are going to, to this kind of non-discretionary spending and interest payments. So that's why, to me, this program with the IMF is very key because... You're suggesting that although the finance minister had assured some months back that there were programs to cut expenditure, it was going to be difficult because of the rigidities within the system. Yeah, he's, cut, he's, he's done some cuts, which uh, we, know, we, we, have to, we have to appreciate what he's done, but it was always going to be difficult. He, he cut to the extent that he could. That's why you know, the cuts have not been more than 20%, because he didn't really have much leeway to do so. You've been a <clears throat> governor of the Seychelles Central Bank. You've also served as a minister of finance. There are many who attribute Ghana's problems to a structural difficulty. Uh, when you look at the economy as a whole, do you get that sense that there are structural challenges with the economy? There is, there is. Uh, I talked about the budget now. Structurally, in the budget, your revenue levels, Ghana is just not, not strong, not, not high enough. The average in sub Saharan Africa is 15%. There are countries who are even higher than that. And Ghana is 13%. So this is a structural issue because if government manages to, to raise more revenues, then you have less of a problem. You have more fiscal space to do more. And, and what we're saying to raise revenues, not necessarily to in increase taxes significantly on businesses, on people, but there are things, there are, there are leakages currently. Uh, the level of, uh, the level of uh, uh, exemptions on taxes are, at high, are too high. There are other areas where VAT expenditures on uh, too high. So there are there are things that need to be done on both sides. But also structural weaknesses exist in sectors. I gave the, the example of the energy sector. It's costing government a billion dollars today. And unless critical reforms uh, happen in these sectors, it will continue to be a burden. And there are solutions. During the COVID, which we know hit a lot of countries, we know the World Bank you know, the IMF, a couple of uh, other institutions had, you know, given monies to the government of Ghana to help, you know, in cushioning, you know, within the crisis because obviously there were disruptions to, you know, to trade. Mm -hmm. Some have said that there were difficulties with government's handling of these funds, a reason why we've had to come where we are today. Um, do you agree with those who say so? I can talk to you about the resources we gave to, to the government. There, there has not been difficulties on our front. We were clear all the time. We've given $430 million to Ghana for COVID. We are currently preparing an additional financing that's been there. You know, and now we are looking at how we're going to manage these funds because COVID is not over. It's, it's, it's out of the way in a major sense. But there is still the risk and there are still need to, you know, to beef up uh, preparedness for pandemic and others. But going back to your question, we, we have always been clear that the resources we give is managed by a, a, a project management unit that is put in place by the bank and government jointly. All funds are paid to contractors, suppliers from the designated account. Our project fund have not gone to the budget of the Ministry of Finance. And because of this, we have fiduciary mechanisms in place that ensure we know each and every dollar that is spent and accounted for. We've done audits, of course. There are always a few things here and there, procedure-wise, maybe 
some documentation that needs to be followed. But largely speaking, we are very satisfied that our, our resources were spent in line with the uh, procurement uh, requirements that existed. You know, COVID was, was, was implemented under emergency procurement measures by the bank. So, and we continue, you know, it's, all the funds for COVID are not spent. It's a, it's a project that, you know, there were immediate things to be spent on, but there were also like constructions and, you know, procurement of equipment and all that. So we, we, we don't feel that our resources have not been properly spent. Uh, there are some who've said that Ghana would require far more than just a balance of payment support. Um, is the World Bank, for instance, willing to give any additional support, quite apart from what we're getting from the IMF? Yeah, we, we, we have taken note of uh, the, the, the negotiations on the program and more than often when this happens, the World Bank does come in. We have uh, instruments like budget support that we can bring to government and we've, we've discussed this. We, government knows and we are clear that uh, our envelope, which is $1.5 billion on a three-year cycle, half a billion dollars every year, we can bring more support to Ghana not just financial, but also technical support. When IMF will come, they will not only give money. It's not about money, you, you, that's what you just said. But balance of payments, dealing with your balance of payment problem is just one, you put the money, you clear what is out today. But a, a, a real, real true reform is more than that. You have to implement reforms that will address the weaknesses that you have today that brought your economy and your fiscal and your debt to be unsustainable. Do you think we can ever get to that point? Because this has been cyclical. Uh, we've almost gone to the world, to the IMF <laughs> every four years. Um, is there ever going to be a time that we are able to plug these loopholes and do all the things that we need to do to ensure we don't go back to the fund? But that depends on, 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 the, on Ghana, on Ghana's leadership, on Ghana's people. And, uh, and, you think it's and, a problem of leadership? No, no, no. What I'm saying is if it's happened like that in the past, Maybe we, we, we de you deal with problems today where things get better, either because of uh, you know, lack of reforms domestically or external factors like we've seen now. Ghana's problem is not only because revenue is not high enough, it's because of the shocks that's, uh, that's uh, occurred in the last three years or so that's happened one after the other. But it's a combination of both. So what I'm saying is, I'm very confident that with a fund program, bank support, the right policy reforms, Ghana will get out. Most, many countries have gone through some worse than this and they've got out. They are doing well today. But what is important is to sustain those gains when the reforms happen. Some have said most of our bilateral partners, you know, and entities that dole out money to African countries are a lot more diplomatic when it comes to you know, diagnosing the problems of countries they support. Uh, recently, we had the IMF board suggest that, you know, COVID was a major reason why Ghana is, is where it is today. Uh, some have criticized that, that, that thought and saying that it's only because Ghana has decided to enter a program. Are you diplomatic? Don't you have the balls to say to government as it is? I cannot speak for other bilaterals or what the IMF board said. I can speak for, for the World Bank. I've sit in this chair for the last three years and I've always said the same thing. I've always said that Ghana's challenges lie where I've told you. Ghana's revenue levels are not sufficient. The, the effort needs to be stronger. Ghana can, can do it. Ghana can raise revenue. Ghana is a, is a country that has shown that it can be up there. Ghana has one of the best indicators in human capital. In, uh, in infrastructure, in others. But there are many areas where more needs to be done. And I've always said that sitting in this chair, I've always talked about the need to raise revenues. I've always, always talked about the need to tackle the problems in the energy sector. We've put our resources, technical and financial, on the table. And uh, we, we stand ready to support Ghana and I think uh, with the IMF program now, it's a great opportunity for us to, to cement our support. I'm sure you've monitored the situation with Ghana since the beginning of the year when we're unable, Parliament was unable to pass their electronic transaction levy. We saw 
uh, the ratings agencies, three of them, uh, downgrade Ghana. We've seen further downgrades to a C uh, category. This has consequently led to investors moving out of the country. We've seen the impacts on the local currency. It's, I mean, it's, it's that bad now. How urgent is, do we need this IMF program? You did it yesterday, in my view. Like yesterday? I mean, it's a, word, it's a way to say it's very urgent. There's, a, there's an urgency. You need, Ghana needs to tackle this problem with urgency. What would you see happening if we don't get this passed as soon as possible? Well, what's happened in the last few months is that uh, inflation has gone up, partly because of what's happening outside, but also partly because the currency has depreciated. Currency is depreciated because you've been losing reserves. And there's a question, an issue of demand and supply for the foreign currency. And of course, if nothing happens, the trend will just continue. There's no other way. I mean, you don't need to be a rocket scientist or you, you, you just, we all know. Do you if, fear for a possible default, like we've seen in Sri Lanka? Look, now government is talking to the IMF. And uh, of course, Sri Lanka was this to will, the IMF when they defaulted. Yeah, but again, it's, it depends how, how, how urgent the uh, government of Ghana is willing to go to the IMF and, and tackle the problem. I cannot tell you that. I don't take that decision. It's uh, the, the government. But, but from where you sit, you think it's, we need it as, as early as From yesterday. where I sit, if nothing happens, it will be very difficult for Ghana to find another way out. Because, because right now, uh, the level of debt and the level of income coming in and the level of reserves you just don't need to pay your debt. You need to have enough reserves to, to import food, to, to import fuel, to do things. So right now where things are heading, we all know it's uh, something has to be done. We recently received some $750 million from the Afri Exim Bank. Uh, it came in, I think, about two weeks ago uh, to help us manage the situation. We saw some relative stability in, in the city's performance. It's, it's begun to... A depreciate again and uh, speaking to the experts they assume it's only because of talks between government and IMF about a possible restructuring of our debt which is probably making investors a bit edgy do you suspect so look I think that there comes a point when everybody accepts that and I think it's reached that point now debt restructuring I feel has to be part of the of the reform process and what's going to happen to Ghana. Even if Ghana was to raise uh, revenues now to the extent that it's more closer to its potential, I think the problems are such that uh, a debt restructuring is, is almost uh, inevitable, or at least it will help. And there's, you know, in the circumstances now, there's nothing wrong. It's better, it's better it happens. At least Ghana will have more breathing space, more fiscal space to, to handle its social programs and others. So, And how do you see this uh, debt restructuring program happening? Uh, one that will result in uh, an investors conference? Really? Yeah, typically what happens is there are two, you know, you have two types of debts. You have, uh, well, three, depends how you see it. Broadly speaking, you have commercial debt, which are the bonds, uh, loans from banks, etc., private debt. And then there are public debts, which are either multilateral debt, IMF, World Bank, FDB. And then there's bilateral debt, which are the UK, the French, the German, the EU, etc. Typically, what happens is it's easier to... And then there's domestic debt, which typically are treasury bills, bonds, banks. Typically, the first step is Paris Club, where the bilateral creditors will give it terms. The challenge for Ghana is that its debt is more... Is, is more heavier toward the private private debt. So it's more challenging, okay? Private debt have been rescheduled before. It's not the first time it will happen. So, you know, there are advisors, experts at government, uh, I understand, are in the process of hiring to assist them with that. So they have to, now, there's a choice of whether you go for domestic debt restructuring, whether you go for external debt restructuring. The challenge is domestic debt restructuring is very difficult. Why? Because 
it's typically banks who invest in government papers, in bonds bills. And when you ask banks to take haircuts and stuff like that, it affects their capital adequacy. And, and it, it, it puts at risk <laughs> those banks, whereby international bilateral debt are easier to reschedule, to restructure, because, you know, this is governments taking a hit. And uh, so there are all these dynamics, and uh, these are all things that I don't want to get too much into. And uh, the finance team and IMF and the, the experts, as well as our debt experts, will all contribute to support Ghana in this process. You formerly served as a, a central bank governor for Seychelles, so it, it's really exciting to be speaking to you. Uh, what do you make of central banks all over the world and their approach to fighting inflation? Uh, we know that, you know, historically, uh, most of the advanced countries, you, you, you see the hikes in policy rates, uh, which has been replicated in a lot of emerging markets, like Ghana, for instance. We've seen uh, a policy rate go up uh, recently as high as, as, as to 23 percent. That was about 300 basis point increase. Uh, there are those who, you know, criticize the central bank's actions. As a former central bank governor, what do you make of it? First, let me tell you, you talk about me, Central Bank. In 2008, my own country, which is much smaller than Ghana, was in exactly, almost identically, the same situation as Ghana. Uh, even worse, our reserves were three days. Here you have a few months left. Everything was the same, inflation was 30%. We came in with an IMF program that for many years was being resisted and it helped. We were able to turn things around. That's what I'm telling you. Ghana can turn things around if they, if they do the right policies. I'm sure it will happen. I'm confident. Um, in terms of what you talk about the central bank, you see instruments available to central bank depends on, 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 on your, for instance, your exchange rate regime. Here you have a free-floating exchange rate. Some countries have, have a fixed exchange rate. And, and when you have a free-floating exchange rate and a more, you know, a more advanced uh, financial market, I'm not saying Ghana is as advanced as the advanced economies, but it's quite, a, you know, quite an advanced uh, financial system relative to the rest of Africa. So the interest rate is, is the tool that you have to control inflation. The reason why inflation, in, the problem is not that the central bank of Ghana is raising, they have to, because today, without that, inflation will just spiral. But we've seen other countries like Turkey, like China, go the opposite direction. I'm telling you, if you, uh, if, if they, they may go in the opposite direction, if they are not using interest rate as the, as the, the tool to control inflation. What they I mean, rather is to reduce interest rates but you, to propel a lot more. How can you reduce reduction? interest rates when inflation is rising? I don't, I don't, I'm not sure what, what, what you're telling me here. If you're telling me mm. inflation is rising, low interest rates, but then you, you just going to exacerbate you do, then, the problem. is to cut out the private sector because they are the major borrowers in the economy. So it's, but it's not borrow at a higher cost. But it's not central bank. This is not central it. bank's fault. I'll tell you whose fault it is. Whose fault is it? It's because the fiscal requirements give banks the appetite to go and invest in treasury bills. If you have a de de deficit of uh, Ghana today, about, or last time, or last year, 9, 10% of GDP, how can you, if you're not collecting revenues, as I told you before, you have to borrow. One way of borrowing, especially recently when the financial markets are shut off, Government needs to spend on salaries, on schools, and on, on the pool. You borrow. And when financial markets closed, Ghana had to borrow domestically more. And when you borrow domestically, what happens? Interest rates go up because banks, government's demand is strong. So banks, and because it's a free, free market, mm. it's a tender system, banks will push up rates because they know government is, needs the money. And when rates go up, you cannot blame Central Bank. I've got about three, four uh, final questions to yeah, ask you. Yeah. Let's return to the World Bank yeah. and its support for Ghana. Um, I heard you talk earlier about some facility you were preparing. Is that to support Ghana 
uh, in its bailout program with the IMF? And how much are you looking at, for instance, how much support can you give us? You know, within the, within the context of the strategy we have for Ghana, mm -hmm. we have an envelope of, of $1.3 billion every three years. And this can be spent either totally in projects or some in budget support, some other instruments like performance-based uh, projects. But, but typically, in, in instances where we have uh, an IMF program, the instrument we use is budget support. So we typically give cash to the government, like IMF didn't give cash, that goes to the budget to help ease the balance of payment crisis. So, uh, there's a lot happening globally with inflation, growth slowing down, and this has impacted a lot of emerging markets like Ghana. Uh, what's your own assessment of, of what's happening in this part of the world? Look, first, uh, we should note that it's not really affected emerging markets. It's really affected even the advanced economies in Europe, as for instance, uh, China, you know, having a lot of challenges. So, uh, COVID was already a very difficult uh, uh, issue to deal with because of the impact on uh, on the economy, on jobs, on uh, employment. But then the crisis in Ukraine has exacerbated the situation for everyone. And in terms of what we're seeing in Africa, there's been obviously a, a general trend of uh, inflation, you know, rising prices of food and fuel especially. And you know, in our countries, uh, mo most of the countries are poor countries. So it's been really hard for for the people and uh, as governments, uh, you know, most governments have tried to to bring the fiscal framework more sustainable. We bring down inflation, we bring down debt through rescheduling and a lower deficit, right? Once this is in place, that's the first condition and adequate macro framework. Secondly, we will need to agree also with government, complementary to what IMF will do, what are the areas of reforms, including structural reforms, where we can come and support you. Because our money doesn't come free. It comes with uh, an assurances that reform in certain areas that we will support financially will happen and complement what IMF is doing. So if Ghana is able to meet all these uh, criteria um, and we're going to get a budget support from the World Bank, how much are we looking at, for instance? Well, I'll tell you generally, uh, normally there's a hard, a hard rule, a soft rule in the bank, whatever we call it. We can give around 30%, 30 to 40% of the, of the country's envelope in budget support. And here for Ghana, you're looking around $600 million. The Ghana's, Ghana's envelope for the next three years is $1.5 billion. So 30% of that, you know, we can go give and take. Mm. But I'm not saying this is what we will give. Mm. It can be more, it can be less. But for us, it's also not about the money. Mm. It's about the strength of the reform package mm. that government will put to us. Mm. You talked yeah. about reforms and, and structural adjustments. You need to be convinced about certain benchmarks. Um, I've heard a lot of people talk about um, some cuts in government flagship programs like free SHS. I know you've been interacting a lot with uh, uh, government officials. What have you been telling them about flagship programs and the sustainability of some of them? Look, we can give opinions at the end of the day Government decides what is best for it. If it decides not to go in the fund program also, it has other ways of doing it. But what, what is more important for us? And I, and I, I was encouraged to see that uh, my MF colleagues also think the same way. It's very important not only to focus on cuts and tightening and increasing. There has to be a balance between three things, right? One is the immediate stop the, the downfall right, through immediate grabbing the economy by the horns, put the immediate measures that will stop the deterioration, consolidate. Secondly, you have to make sure in doing so, you don't compromise, you don't overly compromise the social fabric. Because when typically these programs happen, there are cuts, and very often the poor are at the center of it because social programs are cut. And thirdly, it's the long-term economic transformation agenda. So we, need, we cannot just cut everything, no investment. So there has to be a right balance between the consolidation, the need to protect the poor, and to preserve prospects for growth. Right. And I think this is what a sound IMF program 
we'll, we'll be looking and we we hoping to support my final question to you michelle sure. port um globally seeing what's happening in in america in the european central bank only last week we saw them hide their their interest rate how much of a threat is this going to be for emerging markets like ghana it is a threat because you know Typically, uh, borrowings are based on, uh, you borrow from them. So when the interest rates rise, it affects your debt level and it affects your budget because you, you're now paying more each time. And then when it's, when it's combined with a deteriorating exchange rate, depreciating exchange rate that we've seen in Ghana, it, it makes your problems several times worse. And at a time when our markets are becoming risky and investors are moving out, I'm well, sure it's, it's going to attract them happened. further. It's, it's happened already. I mean, when, when financial markets closed last year, we saw even in domestic currency instruments, some investors moved out. But this is, uh, this also, it, 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 it happens when, when the market is mature. It happens when the market is flexible. And immediately, as confidence returns, we'll see investors come back also. Mr. Pierre Lapop, i say a big thank you to you. Uh, Welcome. Thanks for granting us audience. It was a pleasure. It was a pleasure thank talking you. to you. Mr. Pierre Laporte is the uh, World Bank Country Director, and he was speaking to us on Business Focus. Thanks very much for watching. We'll see you same time next week. Bye-bye.